Hello, DrupalCon. How's everybody doing? Yeah. Who went to an amazing session today? Yeah. Me too. Fantastic. Well, it is my great pleasure to kick off the closing plenary here at DrupalCon in Seattle. Um, it's been a fantastic week. I've heard incredible stories from all of you and from everybody in attendance. Um, I would like to introduce Fred from Platform SH, who will be introducing our first plenary speaker. Thank you, team, and uh, good afternoon, DrupalCon. It is my great honor to be introducing these amazing keynote speakers today that we have for this closing uh, keynote. Uh, my name is Fred Place, and I am the CEO of Platform. And if I may say, Platform SH was sort of born in Drupal. Um, we uh, are very proud to be, for the third year in a row, the uh, platinum sponsor of uh, DrupalCon. Thank you to the Drupal Association for organizing the event. And um, Platform.sh is a 130 people company globally. We are uh, very distributed. We operate from 17 different countries. Our teams are based in 100 different cities. So we are very multicultural. And um, multicultural is, is a thing in Drupal. You guys are not surprised. That's pretty much what Drupal is about, right? But I can tell you this, it is not the norm. And outside of this very fine circle of people, uh, it's actually not, not that common to have such a level of uh, multiculturalism. And uh, I'm very often listening to people asking me, well, you know, how does it even work to have uh, that much of, uh, you know, different backgrounds, and do they actually manage to contribute and work efficiently together? And my answer to them is, guess what? It's, yes, it does. And it's amazing. And I think it's probably the, most, uh, the biggest asset of this company to be leveraging you know, that sort of uh, uh, amazing uh, power that those people have to work together. And I have to say, um, this, uh, this is due to the inspiration of looking at uh, communities, open source communities, and looking at Drupal and the way Drupal is operating with so many people from so many places working efficiently together, both online and offline. So I really want to thank you, Drupal community, for being an inspiration for companies like us like are trying to uh, also be multicultural and, and diverse. And please welcome with me our amazing speakers today, Marcy Seddon, who's head of uh, training at Gatsy. Hi, DrupalCon. Let's get, this, let's get this party started, shall we? So respect, inclusion, collaboration, diversity, communication. These are needs and issues not only of our time, but of all time. I'm Marcy Sutton. I'm a web developer and an accessibility advocate. And now I'm the head of learning at Gatsby. I'm going to talk to you today about a topic that's super near and dear to my heart, JavaScript and civil rights, and the impact that we can make in people's lives as technologists. You can find my slides online at bit.ly slash js-civil-rights, and you can find me on Twitter at Marcy Sutton. So what are civil rights? They're the rights of individuals to receive equal treatment and to be free from unfair treatment or discrimination. Some aspects of civil rights include protection from discrimination, physical and mental integrity, safety, privacy, and the most slippery of them all, freedom of speech. But you know what doesn't belong on this list? Hatred or dis uh, exclusion, not being able to get a book from the library for some reason, or being killed on a train for standing up for big against bigotry being discriminated against in the workplace because of your gender or your age. So equal rights mean that we all have equal protection under the law, and frankly, people have fought for this. Historically, fighting for the, for, in the civil rights movement in the 1960s, people picketed for equal rights to housing. Other movements, including feminism and gay rights, they were built on top of the civil rights movement. 
And these days, more currently, in the EU, people fighting for the rights of disabilities and pushing the, the European uh, Disability Forum to have a more ambitious uh, set of legislation to improve accessibility in the EU. And there's this sort of famous saying for people with disabilities, nothing about us without us. So it's all about protecting our users and our colleagues and collaborators' rights to access safety and privacy. And then there's JavaScript. I know we're at DrupalCon, so PHP is you know, our, our back-end language that we're mostly talking about. But these days, JavaScript is a part of the user experience that people have come to expect. And people are going to build user interfaces with JavaScript. It's used heavily in Drupal as well. So we might as well talk about making it as inclusive as possible, because it's out there. It's ubiquitous, pivotal, and modern. So today, let's talk about how JavaScript applies to people's civil rights. And we'll discuss accessibility, security, safety, privacy, and ultimately, people's freedom. So accessibility, it's all about freedom from discrimination. And in terms of physical spaces, we have a, an image of a man in a wheelchair getting onto the bus. So public spaces need to be accessible. Say you're navigating through a building and you need Braille to, to identify where you are. With web accessibility, the same concepts apply. Web accessibility is the inclusive practice of removing barriers that prevent interaction with or access to websites by people with disabilities. And it's essential that we build web accessibility into every experience, every pull request, every commit. Because if we do it as we go, it's a lot easier than trying to tack it on at the end and fix the mess that you've created. And really, it's about all of us. This applies to every single one of us. You might not have a disability now, but your life can change. Your family could be affected, your friends. And I really enjoy the Microsoft Inclusive Design Toolkit, which has a set of personas that really motivate accessibility as it applies to inclusive design, and therefore all of us. Say you have one arm and you have a permanent disability. The same accessibility support that would help you would also help someone in a more situational disability, such as a new parent or someone with a cup of tea in their hand. So I'm challenging you to put your values to work and to help people. And I feel like this is the right audience because you're probably already doing some of this. But let's talk about how we can apply the, this, these concepts to the work that we do every day. In Drupal, there's a great foundation for accessibility and building quality websites that support a wide range of people. And I've been really pleased to read things from Dries talking about Drupal's commitment to accessibility. It's really refreshing at a time when WordPress has stumbled and failed to include collaborators telling them what needs to improve with accessibility. And I don't bring this up to sling mud, only to communicate the importance of inclusion when the stakes are so high. Our sites can affect millions of people around the world. So one thing that you could do to, to establish this commitment and this leadership with accessibility is to write an accessibility statement. And we recently introduced one on the GatsbyJS.org website. And what I want to communicate to you is that you don't need to be perfect. Good leadership is admitting that things might go wrong, and it's all about how you handle it after that. Give people a way to contact you and provide feedback in, in case they encounter barriers. So leadership is a huge part of this, and I've been really pleased to see Drupal's leadership in this area, even inviting me to do this talk, inviting Nithya to do her talk on inclusion. That demonstrates a commitment and leadership to inclusion that you don't find everywhere. And it's also worth mentioning that uh, in addition to that top-down leadership, it will take a commitment from all of us to make a difference, because the lone accessibility champion can do a lot of great things, but to make lasting change, it's going to take a commitment from all of us. And here's why. Because there's people who need accessibility support to make a living, to use websites, to live more uh, full lives with their dignity intact. And I have a post here from Amanda Rush, who works with WordPress, and she says, I do not have the privilege of simply ignoring Gutenberg's accessibility problems because when it becomes the default editor, those accessibility problems will directly affect my livelihood. This was written back in December when Gutenberg was sort of forced out the door. Uh, 
basically at the protest of people in the accessibility community. Um, it was rolled out without a user guide. And so those guardrails and those systems that are put in place and upheld, and I know Drupal has done this, to make sure that there are accessibility gates, that upholds quality that makes a, an actual difference in people's lives. So let's look at an example of some poor accessibility. And I'm, they're going to play this video for us, and it will use the, uh, sorry, the Mac uh, voiceover screen reader. And we're going to look through this user interface. It's not all bad, but the landing screen has some accessibility issues. So we're going to hear what it's like for a screen reader user. Window, work stack, web content has keyboard focus. Link. Yes, please. You are currently on a link. To click this let open intercom messenger button. You are current leaving frame. Link. Visited. Link. Calendar. Menu. Link. Projects. Link. People. Link. Reports. Link. MS slash 1CD529DZOAA4DDA3B1242835016386E.JPEG D question S equals 200 and D equals blank. You are current group. You are current link. Plus invite user. Expanded link. Everyone. Link. Show. No one result is available. Use up and down arrow keys to navigate. You are currently on a text field. To enter, no project. No project. Unselected. One result is available. Use up and down arrow keys to navigate. At Marcy Sutton. You are Marcy Sutton. You are Marcy Sutton. You group. You are currently on a group. You are currently on a group link. Yes, please. You are currently on a link. To click the open intercom messenger button, intercom leaving frame. Kind of brutal, right? I mean, there's unlabeled alt text. So you heard that cached file name being read out when I landed on a link. And all I was doing was pressing the tab key to reach interactive controls. So for keyboard and screen reader users, it's super important that we make our interactive controls accessible. Um, there were items that I was reaching that I couldn't operate. I was using the arrow keys as voiceover was instructing me, and we heard my voice pronounced in different tones, which was kind of cool, um, but not super usable from a, a user interface perspective. So let's look at another example that was built with more accessibility in mind and see that this is possible to achieve with a little more care. DML content has keyboard focus. You are currently a link. Skip to main content. Complimentary three items. Heading level one, courses. Banner two items. Courses filter, pop-up button. Current courses, selected. Button main courses, one item. Link, meeting management. You are currently on a link. To click this link, heading level one, meeting management. Banner two items. Link, skip to main content. Main courses, one item. Heading level two, details and actions. Complimentary six items. Menu pop-up link. Roster view everyone in your course. Courses open, students can access this course. Pop-up button. Join session, collapsed, pop-up button. More options for collaborate, pop-up button. Link, books and tools, main four items. More options for course content, pop-up button. Add new content above team building assignment, collapsed, button. Add new content above team building assignment, expanded, button. You are currently, visited, link, create. You are currently on a link, to click this heading level one, create item, banner one item. Course content items, selected, expanded, tab main courses one item, you are, link, folder. Visited, link, document. You are currently on a link, new document, edit text. Capital C, E, F, F, I, B, I, F, T, Y. Access, accessibility. You are currently on a text field. To enter text in this field, type. So that's Blackboard's user interface for education. And you can imagine in an education platform, super important to include everyone so they have an equal access to their education. But it goes way beyond education, healthcare, government, um, HR applications, banking, grocery shopping. I mean, it's really hard to find a niche of our technology world that would not benefit from accessibility. So some highlights of what we, we saw there were focus management, which is super important in JavaScript. So when those new layers opened, our focus was sent into them. They did a really great job of labeling buttons that were little icon buttons where there were multiple instances of them, but they had unique names. So a screen reader user would know what that instance of that button does. They also communicated their proximity to other interactive content. And so this, to me, is a really great example of what can be achieved with these rich JavaScript-heavy interfaces with some attention to accessibility. Some UI considerations if you're building interfaces for people to use. This is sort of basic, but it's always worth reiterating that using accessible and semantic HTML will get you a really long way because you get a lot of behavior for free. 
adding keyboard support, making sure that if there are inactive layers like the modal in our first example, I was stuck behind that modal and there were two buttons in that modal, but I can only reach one of them. So making sure that the keyboard can actually reach interactive controls and then focus management for these layers of mo and modals. Making sure if you have JavaScript changing the views or the pages of your application that you announce in a screen reader that things have changed. And then this is a big one in, in Drupal, as we just heard, localization and personalization and giving users control and then remembering what their preferences were. There's a really great documentation site for Drupal 8. I recommend you checking that out. And if you're actively developing, working on accessibility in the moment is a great way to chip away at it over time. And I really recommend the Chrome developer tools for accessibility. You can inspect the DOM or the document object model, and then you can use this accessibility inspector to see what is happening in your, your page. There's also a color contrast tool in the color picker that I love a lot. And there are tools in both Firefox and Safari that are great as well. Baking in some automated testing is really important for these longer living websites and web applications. And I used to work on a tool called AxCore. It's an open source JavaScript library that has a set of accessibility rules that are they're open source. So if you find an issue, you can go and communicate with them on GitHub. And in Drupal, you can integrate this using Nightwatch. So there's a really awesome post at bit.ly slash drupal dash ax dash nightwatch and I'll have a list of resources at the end for you. Um, but that would be a great thing to look at if you want to integrate accessibility testing into your application. But it's also worth mentioning that we can only automate so much. And the human element, that, that manual testing element, is very critical as well. And I want to take a moment to remember Rachel Olivero, who recently passed away. She did so much to contribute to the Drupal community. And that is the example that we should really remember. When we need help, there's people there to help you. People like Everett Zufeld, people like Carrie Fisher, Mike Gifford, and so many more names of people who are there to help you if you need some assistance. So let's transition a little bit to security. Super important in the world of web development, and I can't let Drupal off scot-free and not mention Drupal Geddon. So, but it's not unique to Drupal either. Um, these security vulnerabilities could happen no matter what web platform you're using. And there's an example recently of a third-party accessibility tool called Browse Aloud that became a cryptocurrency mining. Uh, it was a, an attack vector that was compromised, and this can happen. So we need to protect against this so that our users and our, you know, our sites are not being compromised. I have a tweet here from Scott Helm saying, the more I think about this, the worse it becomes. Attackers had arbitrary script injection on thousands of sites, including many NHS websites here in England. Just stop and think for a few moments about what exactly they could have done with that capability. And they even talk about some techniques in this thread that maybe could have prevented this from happening. So it's worth training your team on security. And some tips here that I would recommend are to use HTTPS. Use secure sites with whatever the most modern protocol is. Keep your software up to date by patching servers, keeping uh, Drupal up to date, any JavaScript modules or PHP packages that you happen to download, keep those up to date. Sanitize user input. So from what I've read about the last Drupal get-in, that was a big part of why that happened, is not to trust user input. And even the things that are more creative, like modifying the developer tools, um, we have to protect against those things. That, uh, the browse allowed example, possibly if, we, if you had checked the integrity of a script, so caching it and seeing if the source still matches to make sure it wasn't tampered with in transit. And then following InfoSec best practices. So read up on the OWASP top 10, train your teams on security uh, because it's pretty high stakes. And going along with this, transitioning into safety, which is sort of uh, tangentially related to security. You may have heard of the instance where a journalist had a tweet sent to them with a flashing GIF. This journalist had epilepsy. And so that flashing GIF was actually an, a deadly weapon, and that person was prosecuted for that. So I'm going to show a video of how this can play out in a user interface. Um, I have a website that moves a lot, and it's pretty, it was considered innovative, and it, it is kind of pushing the envelope with the user interface, but it makes me physically ill. 
So when the pages transition, the whole interface turns and rotates, and I won't leave it up too long because it, it does make me physically sick. Uh, so what you need to do is provide affordances for users, not ship them off to a PDF or a plain site. Just give them a button to turn the animation off, and that way they can, t they can use it in a way that doesn't make them sick. There's also this great tool now called Prefers Reduce Motion, which is a CSS media query, and you have a JavaScript function called Match Media, where you can respond to the user's preference. And this is an operating system level setting that is pretty powerful. It started with WebKit. And on iOS and OS X, in your system preferences as a user, you can go and click this Reduce Motion setting, and then your websites will respond to that. You can use CSS and JavaScript to make custom um, animation-free versions of your user interface. So that's now in Safari, Firefox. I think they're working on it in Chrome. Uh, it's on Windows and OS X. So hopefully we'll see that in more places. It has caught on quite a bit, so I think you can safely use that in any modern interface. So let's play one more video of a, the Giphy website, which if you have sensitivity to motion, pages with animated GIFs can, can kind of be jarring. So one thing I like about this um, Giphy site is that they do have that autoplay button, play pause, up in the top. And there's another GIF here that we haven't seen, but Giphy is full of them. They're all over. There's Fran Drescher, and it, it's sort of dizzying to watch this zoom in on her. But they did add these play pause buttons. So if you have motion, this is another example of why adding those toggles can be super useful. And here's a great tweet from Tasha that says, dear every web developer in the history of ever and all the future to come, don't play autoplay anything ever. And you can even see that Twitter had added those play buttons onto animated GIFs. And I think that's also a user setting. So giving people more control to personalize their experience really plays into making safe experiences. The Brave browser has a great way to control autoplaying media, where it will detect autoplaying videos and give you the ability to allow or deny that autoplay, and it will remember your decision. So if we have this in more browsers, I know Chrome uh, revisited their autoplay policy a year or two ago. This is one way that users can have the control to keep things from autoplaying, but we can't control what browsers our users are in. So giving them buttons to control it themselves in your user interface is a good way to go. So let's talk about privacy, another big component of respecting our users and collaborators' civil rights. I was recently looking at this article. Um, I think I was on theguardian.com, and this ad came up for, I think it was for yogurt. And within a few minutes, I you know, went from this website, went over to Instagram, and I got the same advertisement. That's because websites have been leaking our data, and they track you across the web using tracking cookies, ad networks. Uh, they measure your behavior and file uh, dossiers and profiles on you. And there's no way to opt out of this stuff. It's not regulated in the United States. So we have to be really careful with how we, uh, like what tools we're using so I have one more video here of the Discuss commenting platform. And this, these scripts will load uh, as I refresh my web page. This was my WordPress site. And there's all these third-party scripts that download that I didn't know were being downloaded. And each one of these could be an attack vector. We think about Browse Aloud, which got compromised. Any one of these could be compromised. So I ended up removing Discuss. I think they've improved a little bit. They give you more control, and they've written about GDPR. But personally, as a developer, they've lost me by now. I don't have commenting on my website anymore. I was pleased to see this post from Dries that said how to remove YouTube tracking. And it's pretty simple. When you copy the code from YouTube to embed, embed a video, there's a little checkbox that you can enhance privacy mode. And all it does is use a YouTube-nocookie domain instead of the regular YouTube domain, and it will prevent a tracking pixel or a tracking cookie from being added to the user's browser. So this is more compliant with GDPR for regulations for privacy in Europe. Um, it's a really simple way to not be contributing to this tracking of your users. So the tools we use should not undermine our users' privacy. And as technologists, this can be sort of difficult because we have competing priorities with business and marketing. 
But if we at least look at what our tools are doing, it, we will be more informed. You have more of a business case to not put your privacy up against your business needs. Um, and that's always going to be an ongoing conversation. It can be a bit challenging in big organizations. Um, but be a champion for your users' privacy. And this goes all the way back to people with disabilities. Here I have a tweet from Leonie Watson saying, Facebook, using educated guesses to trap people into confirming they have a disability is not acceptable. And they ha she had a screenshot from Facebook's interface saying, we have some questions about your screen reader. So they were using heuristics to determine whether she had a screen reader turned on and then therefore having a disability because people with disabilities are commonly using screen readers. And Leonie does not want to trade her privacy for access. And a lot of people with disabilities feel that way. And that's why we can't track people using screen readers on the web. It's for this privacy purpose. Marco Ziha from Mozilla says, the screen reader detection is a bad thing because it's like walking around on the web with a white flag going, hi, I'm disabled, when otherwise that could be the one place that they can be equal and they can do their banking and their shopping and not have to be out in the world trying to you know, get sighted help or using a computer vision app in the grocery store. It's a pretty big time saver to be able to use online services. And so having to f disclose that you have a disability in order to use a platform is, is a huge miss. And we can actually do better by just making it usable for everyone. There's a really controversial um, technology in the web world called the Accessibility Object Model. And it's been developed at the Web Incubator Community Group. This is a, a screenshot from their GitHub repository. And they've done a really good job of considering privacy, having discussions about privacy. And I think they've, they're at a point now where there's really great, uh, a really great foundation for moving forward. It has been implemented by Apple, however, and they used an older version of the spec previous, that was prior to some of these privacy conversations. And just a day or two ago, Apple wrote this post about accessibility events. This is a technology that would allow you to uh, use events with assistive technology to add more enhanced functionality. And there's sort of a, a tug of war here with, with priorities, like developers who want to make more cutting edge accessible experiences, and they need more tools for that pinned up against ex disabled people's privacy. And we should really not have to trade our, our privacy for access. So this is something to watch and be very careful about if you're planning to use it. One thing you can do, since we can't track people with disabilities, if you absolutely need more data, um, you can look at resources like the WebAIM screen reader survey. Um, but if you have analytics, you could do some event level tracking on keyboard events to say, hey, are people using these skip links? Are people using the keyboard to navigate through the page? And that would uh, give you data on every user, not just people with disabilities, anyone that's using the keyboard. I do need to say, however, in terms of privacy, that you need a public privacy policy and a way to opt out from this analytics. And if you don't need analytics, don't do it, because it's, it's another layer of privacy that you need to manage with cookie banners, with these ways to opt out. So yeah, if you don't need analytics, don't go that route. But if you do and you have a good po privacy policy, you could track some event level things just for the keyboard. So to recap, accessibility is a civil right. And it's super important that we uphold this because you collectively have so much power in the world. And you can make a huge difference in people's lives for better or worse. So why not do the good thing and actually improve things for people? Um, because it really, as I mentioned earlier, it applies to all of us. Inclusive design can touch the lives of everyone. Safety and privacy, too. Um, these concerns, I mean, whether or not you've realized it before, these do map back to people's civil rights. And they're all very interlinked, very connected. Uh, we saw with accessibility and privacy, those are very intertwined. With safety and security, those are very intertwined as well. So our work can impact people's lives. And I really hope that your takeaway from this talk is that you can make a difference with every line of code, with every design, with every proposal for a project. Um, so I implore you, let's do better. And I think I'm with the right crowd because I think you're already going to do a great job. So thank you so much. You can find me on Twitter and GitHub at Marcy Sutton. I created a page just for you on my website at marcysutton.com slash DrupalCon. You can find a list of resources and articles that I mentioned in this talk. So thank you so much.
Thank you, Marcy. I think that was a fantastic reminder of all the things that we should be doing as a community and that we've committed to, particularly within the Drupal community. I thought maybe as a quick sort of follow-up question, I'd ask the audience, raise your hand if you have navigated your site keyboard only. Pretty good, fairly impressive. Uh, raise your hand if you've done it with voice assistance. Also not bad. So clearly there's a large number of people here um, who've experimented with understanding the accessibility of their sites, of the sites they maintain for their clients. And I think what that means is, I want to see you tomorrow, on Friday at the contribution day. Um, this is an opportunity to, talk, to contribute to accessibility um, and, a, and, a, and a good chance to give back in just the ways that Marcy spoke about. Um, so it's my um, honor now to introduce Nithya Ruff, our next plenary speaker, who will be talking about building inclusive communities. Please join me in welcoming Nithya to the stage. Okay, so it's fantastic to be here, and uh, what an honor to close out the conference, right, um, and end on a really positive note. As I was building this deck, and I lead the open source practice at Comcast, I realized that I would be speaking to the choir. I would be speaking to a community that already does extremely well in this area. So let me uh, go about why I thought this topic was so fantastic, and also to share with you how proud I am to be part of this community. It really starts with the fact that the 21st century that we live in is an era of unprecedented diversity. The world is closer than ever before. Our users, our markets, our talent, our developers are everywhere. And they come in all shapes and sizes. They come in all forms. Um, they are small, they're big, they're accessible, not accessible, abilities, not having the abilities, gender fluid, et cetera. So it becomes so crucial to create communities that are inclusive, to create organizations that are inclusive. That is one of the reasons I felt that this was still worth talking about even though this community is so inclusive, there's such a need, and it's even more urgent than ever before in the world today to create inclusive and healthy communities. With the level of diversity, it becomes urgent that our leaders know how to create this, these inclusive communities. And I find that most technical projects, most products, most companies often start out from the technology side with an idea, with uh, some sort of code that solves a problem. But then, you know, very soon we forget that it's people who create this uh, code, people who create the solution, and, and we need to really start focusing on the people that surround that technology, that surround that project. And most successful projects that I have observed tend to be very inclusive projects. They are projects that can be sustained, that grow, that scale, because they think about inclusion, they think about policies and principles, and, and really the values by which that they want to live by. This saying from Werner Myers, who's, who is now the diversity chief at uh, Netflix, really resonated with me. It's not enough to just assemble a group of people that are diverse and get different perspectives from everyone. What's important is to empower those people to actually share their perspectives, to have a seat at the table, to express their voice, to be part of the decision making, to be heard. And so it's not enough to just bring people together. It's the inclusion that really unleashes their ability to make an impact from a diverse perspective. And, and I find that we are very often have very great intentions as people, as leaders, as part of companies, as part of projects, but very often we don't know how to do it, how to model inclusion, how to build inclusion into our projects. And especially in open source, we find that we often come from a very technical background and we're often not trained or not given the tools to know how to handle people issues, how to build communities, 
that are sustainable and that are uh, inclusive. So when you really double click on what does inclusion mean, it really means respecting basic human values. And when you think about human values, it refers to values which are at the core of being human. These are values that are basic, inherent values that make us good human beings. It's things like truth, it's honesty, it's love, it's peace, because they bring out the goodness in all of us. And really, inclusion means to allow people the respect of being fully human. And you find that we all, as managers, as leaders of projects, and as leaders of communities, we always say, I want my community to be healthy. I want my community to be engaged. I want my community to be productive. And the way to do it is really to create an inclusive project, a project and a place where people feel safe, included, and valued is often a place where people are happy, they're more engaged, and they're more loyal. When I look back at times where I have been the most productive, it's always been communities where people allowed me to be my authentic self, to bring my complete self to the table, to not fear being judged, and to feel like I belong, and that I'm not being an imposter at the table. And those are the places where I felt that I was joyful, and I was comfortable to express my views, and I brought my full self to the table. And healthy communities are not difficult. We can and need to build cultures of inclusion. So here are 12 observations that I've come to uh, in, in all my years working in open source. I've been in a number of different communities. I've worked across a number of different com companies. Um, and in, over these 25 so plus years of working in open source as well as in companies, I, I've kind of boiled it down to about 12 principles or 12 observations. And it, to my delight, when I went to the DrupalCon website and Drupal.org website and looked at the principles and values that Drupal lives by, they were very, very similar. And, and I was really thrilled to kind of look at the detail and, and the amount of intention and work that went into the Drupal values. So the first one is exactly that. It, it takes intent. It doesn't come by accident. As with a lot of things in life, you need to have a plan, you need to have a goal, you need to have intent, you need to make a choice to be inclusive as a community. Uh, we don't reach our goals in life or objectives accidentally. Sometimes, yes, accidents and luck does happen. And that happens because we were prepared. Luck favors those who are prepared, they say. But I also want to mention that it really starts at the leadership level. Uh, often leaders of projects come with that intention, come with that ethos, comes with those values, like Dries does, and that then builds that intention and make sure that everything that the project touches or does is intentionally inclusive. You cannot do it by accident. You cannot do it and wing it um, as, as a principle. The other thing I want to mention is you have to create an environment that you want to be in. When you talk to a lot of leaders, they say that they often uh, create an environment that they would prefer to be in, that they would enjoy being in. I happen to work in a, in a division of Comcast, which is fantastic, and where I feel very included. And I was talking to my leader the other day, and I said, what, why, why is this group so good? Is it because you feel that you need to role model it for the rest of the company, or is it because you were told to do this? And what John said to me is, it's because I believe in these values. These are the kind of values that I would like to be in, and these are the types of teams I would like to be in. And so I would say this is very, very important that you bring your authentic self to work, you bring the values that you care about, and create an environment that you care about. Empathy is at the heart of everything that good communities have. And empathy for your users, empathy for developers, empathy for people you work with, empathy for others and their perspectives. It allows you to create more inclusive solutions, as Marcy was saying. 
It allows you to make broader and more proper choices. And ego does just the opposite. Ego often kind of uh, surrounds you with fear. Uh, you don't want to open up your mind or listen to something else because you fear uh, something different or that it's not what you believe in. And so it's so important to have an open mind and to really have the heart to listen to what your community wants, what your users want, what your customers want uh, when you're creating an inclusive community. So the fourth uh, observation to me is diverse perspectives, not groupthink. Sometimes when we surround ourselves with people who think just like us, then we really arrive at the same conclusion all the time. And I love this community because you have such a variety of people in this community. You have creative types who write content. You also have web developers. And then you have the backend developers. And then you have such a wide variety of uh, people that come to these events and that you go seek and invite to these events. And I love that. And the fact that Marcy and I were invited and so many other speakers were invited to speak here to bring different perspectives to the table, I think is, is a wonderful thing. And you have to acknowledge that also contributions come from all types of people and all kinds of contributions. And I love that people get credit for contributing uh, things like uh, organizing meetups or improving the documentation or improving accessibility or localization or as I said, read from your principles, even referring a friend or saying something favorable about the community to somebody else, it really truly makes it inclusive. Uh, many communities that I know tend to just value code contributions and not all other forms of contribution, and that sometimes really diminishes the, the work that it takes to make communities and to build successful communities. So number five would be kind of redundant, right? Inclusion, not exclusion. And inclusion is often seen through our actions and not words. Sometimes we'll say all the right words, but our actions say completely different things. So we organize events in the evening when we know that there are a number of people who have second jobs or they have to go home to take care of their families, and, and yet we organize events in the evening. We know that there are a number of diabetics in our group, and yet we always have donuts uh, as, as a Friday morning um, you know, feast. And then you find that you have many people who don't like to go to go-karts or golfing, and, and yet you organize those events all the time. So those are the kind of activities which say, I really don't value you, or I don't want to include you in all these activities, or I'm not really thinking about uh, all of these things. And uh, it really takes action, not just words, to make sure that we include everyone. Uh, I'll tell you another example. We are a very remote and, and kind of distributed team. And my boss always makes sure to uh, have all of us on the, on the Zoom uh, interface in video form, even those who sit in the office with him, so that we are all equal on the website or on our, on our screens, and the people remote don't feel disadvantages, disadvantaged, disadvantaged and than the people that are in the room. I think that takes a special kind of caring and, and thinking um, to in action to include people. Listen more and talk less. This again goes with empathy, and this goes with inclusion. Especially as leaders, the more we listen, the more we learn and grow. It may mean following people who are different than you on Twitter. It may mean you know, calling upon different voices in the room, even the quiet voices, even the voices that don't speak, and making sure that all of their voices are heard listening to the challenges that they face, and, this, and then you also discover that you have a lot of similarities. I find that when I get to know someone from a particular community, I actually, it, it dismisses a lot of myths and, and false assumptions that I have about that community. Knowing someone in person really, really uh, changes the whole dynamic of what you think of that particular community. 
evolve, don't stagnate. And I think you all in your principles in Drupal talk about constant learning. You also talk about the fact that change is a constant. The world changes around you, norms change around you, and communities need to evolve and make adjustments along the way. We need to be learners, and then not just learners, but when you learn something fascinating, something interesting, something good, share it with somebody else, right? And let lift everybody else up around you and not just uh, learn the knowledge yourself. One of the values that we have as a team is if you learn something, share it. If you learn something, document it. If you learn something, see if there's an opportunity to automate it. Empower, don't tear down. And I loved listening to one of the sessions that I was in yesterday where people were talking about opening doors to new Drupal learners. And they talked about the fact that, you know, give them a chance to speak at the conference, give them a chance to make a commit, you know, give them a chance to shine. And, and don't always give it to the same people who are highly seasoned, highly experienced. Let someone new uh, shine or grab the moment. I've heard many stories in the hallway about people uh, sharing their privilege with others and people working with others on their imposter syndrome, making sure that they don't feel like an imposter, that they feel like they belong. And sometimes in the language that we use, we can make people feel like imposters in, in confusing them or intimidating them with the words that we use. And so understanding how people feel and empowering them to uh, feel that, that they belong, that they are valuable in this community is, is wonderful. The ninth principle I would say is recognize and celebrate. And this is kind of an interesting one because sometimes meritocracy can be a double-edged sword because if we recognize certain types of behaviors and it, it basically says a lot about we as a community. And what people say about meritocracy is that sometimes it can exclude because we may define meritocracy in such a narrow way that it ex excludes certain people. So it's very, very important to think of who we recognize, how we recognize as a community. And, and I love the fact that communities here are recognizing the quiet ones, the people who chop the wood, who fetch the water, who do all of the activities behind the scenes that one often doesn't see, but are still needed in this community and are still needed to keep the lights on and to keep the community moving. And so what we recognize is just as important as how we celebrate these recognitions. Sustain and don't destroy. So there's a lot of talk in open source these days about how do we sustain open source? How do we make sure that uh, projects don't you know, die because the maintainer is exhausted and has burnout? and that we make sure that projects have sufficient money, sufficient contributions to sustain it for the long haul. And I think some of it comes from resourcing the community, giving back as companies. We really need to give back. We can't just be passive consumers. But the other thing really goes towards having a very vibrant, a healthy, inclusive community. Because the more new people we bring in, the more welcoming we make the community, the longer the community can last and the, the more vibrant and active and, and moving forward that the community is. Advocate openly is another um, quality that I love. Um, leaders in particular have an opportunity to demonstrate how they support the underrepresented, underprivileged, the new people in the community, the people who are different, and they can role model this. They can make sure that people understand that this is a value that we stand by and that I proudly and openly will advocate this to everybody. Just, just sheer doing it in public sets a ripple effect uh, across the community to make sure to do the same and to support people and to know that this is something that we proudly do. This really goes along with um, the role modeling, being an ally. To me, you really have to demonstrate as a leader that you are an ally, 
that you're an advocate, and that you will uh, be demonstrating these values in front of everyone. I really loved the Dries note yesterday because Dries started with how he recognized the importance of this community, of the people in this community, and the values of this community, and recognized all the hard work that goes to making it an inclusive community. I love that that was the beginning. It wasn't about all of the technical achievements that that was coming, but the first and foremost thing that he did was talk about the values. I was also in the Ask Drew Dries questions, and I was quite amazed at a lot of the listening that happened, a lot of the candidness, a lot of the openness with which these questions were answered. You know, people watch, and, and leaders have to act as role models because um, people then observe those behaviors and, and kind of emulate those behaviors. Uh, frankly, when my leader uh, leaves at 5 o'clock and shows me that he cares about his family and he goes home uh, to take care of his family and doesn't send me emails over the weekend, it shows me that it's okay, that I can too you know, live a balanced life and that I don't need to constantly be worrying about working on the weekend or sending emails on the weekend. And these are small things, but they make a big difference in creating an inclusive community. And, and frankly, there's so much positive peer pressure in our group because our values are published, our leader behaves in a certain way. There's that ripple effect, and all of us feel compelled to also demonstrate positive behavior and to bring our best selves to work. We look up and value uh, how our leaders behave. So it's important to, I, I know I'm, I have a lot more time, but I don't think I'm gonna take all of it. But I wanted to say that it's not enough to just build a diverse team. It's not enough to just talk about diversity. We often stop at diversity. And we really need to move beyond diversity to actually valuing inclusion and acting inclusive. It means that we welcome everyone, we make this a safe place for them to be in, and, and for them to kind of be fully actualized and to be fully empowered and to be fully functional. And I want to say that a lot of inclusive communities are often happy communities. And, and as I was going around since Monday, I've been at DrupalCon, and this is my first DrupalCon. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you for including me in this community. And I, I feel like I've fallen in love with this community because it's a happy community. It, it, from the moment people contacted me to welcome me to this community, to all the people who you know, ask me, am I okay? Did I have everything I needed? Um, do I need more information? Do I have the slides? Do I have this? It was just lovely. And I felt, uh, you know, totally welcome and empowered to be here. I also want to say, uh, I work for Comcast, NBC Universal, and NBC especially for all of their websites, Sci-Fi, Bravo, Telemundo, um, a sports network, and Golf Network, we use Drupal. We use Drupal 7, Drupal 8. We love the fact that it allows us to create very, very interactive digital experiences with our customers and fan base. As you know, this is a very competitive field. This is a, a, an environment where our consumers and our fans want more and more and more. And to become a beloved band, brand, that is, we really need tools like Drupal that allow us to deliver those types of magical interactions, customizations, and personalizations to our customers. So I want to end by saying uh, we love Drupal, and we are very happy to be here. I'm very happy to be here. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, uh, you can find me at Nithya Ruff. And thank you so much for your time and uh, for creating such an inclusive community.
Thank you, Marcy. Thank you, Nithya, uh, for these tremendous conversations that I think have kept a trajectory of the conversation in the Drupal community about diversity inclusion, about accessibility, about growing our community by understanding who needs to be in the room, who needs to be part of the conversations, and who can help us to be better. Um, I think it's also important to um, uh, recognize uh, everything that we've accomplished so far this week. Talk a little bit about what DrupalCon was like uh, for these past several days. So how was the week for all of you? Some fantastic sessions, some good things going on? Awesome. Fantastic. I heard some really good feedback. Um, uh, on Twitter, we've seen some amazing messages just related to messages in the Dries note. Um, just the feedback that we've heard was phenomenal. The reach that it had was absolutely incredible. Um, I'm really thrilled uh, to see the community reaction and the community response to everything that's been uh, done here at this event. And plus, the bunnies and puppies, come on. <laughs> like, how can you resist? Um, I do want to pause for a moment, though. Um, Marcy mentioned this briefly in her message to remember a member of the community that we lost this year. Um, so Rachel Olivero was um, an accessibility ex expert who passed away in February and an advocate for digital equality, um, just really a superhero in the accessibility space, and became involved in the Drupal community actually relatively recently. Uh, it was when DrupalCon was in Baltimore. Uh, just in 2017, and she participated in her first contribution day, contributed her first bug report, and she really um, made significant contributions to the way that the Drupal community uh, treats accessibility um, uh, for the vision impaired. So a little bit about the week, about the week we've had together. Um, I'm thrilled to announce that we've had 35% first time attendees here at the con, a wonderful growth of our community, bringing in a lot of new voices and a lot of new faces. I think that's fantastic. Uh, throughout the week, both here directly at the conference and internationally as people collaborate with us and with the people who are here, there have been over 950 commits to the project, um, advancing Drupal and, and moving it forward. This is also the biggest DrupalCon ever in our history, and we are thrilled to, to announce that to you. And uh, you may notice that I don't have a number on that slide. I wonder why that would be. Um, we're going to have a little game following DrupalCon. If you watch the hashtag, can you believe it? Uh, we'll have a little collaborative guessing game about some more stats about the events um, and just to have a little fun with the community uh, as we roll out the evening. So it's time to show our appreciation for everyone who made this possible. And I'll ask you to join me in giving thanks uh, to a wide number of people. Um, if you are a person who is on this list, who is in the audience, I ask you to stand as this applies to you. Um, the first category is pretty broad, so maybe wait for some of the second ones. But uh, first, thank you to all DrupalCon volunteers who have made this possible. In particular, thank you to the track team that help us select the sessions and make all the great content available to everyone. Um, thank you to the program team that picked the individual ones, that decided where these would be placed, that helped schedule all of this for you. Thank you to all of the on-site volunteers who are doing room monitoring, who are, who are mentoring people in sprints. Thank you to the contribution leads who have done a tremendous job introducing new people to contributing in this landscape, and the whole mentor team who supported that as well. And I wanted to give a special thanks to uh, three members of the Drupal Association staff who have been really core to making this event happen, and I'm, I'm fairly sure none of them can be here because they're still making this event happen. But uh, I want to say a special thank you to Rebecca, Carly, and Bethany, who you've seen all over the Convention Center making this possible. So we really want to hear from you after this event. There's a uh, SurveyMonkey link here, surveymonkey.com slash r slash DrupalCon Seattle. Um, there will be, if you participate, you'll be entered in the uh, a drawing to win a ticket for DrupalCon Minneapolis. So we really need your feedback. There were a lot of changes this year, and I've heard wonderful things in the hallways. I've heard frank feedback about things. But we want to use a data-driven approach to know what we, what we should do next. So please respond and let us know what you thought of the event, what you'd like to see. Um, also, give feedback to your speakers. There's this big blue button that should appear on the website for any session you attended. You can click on that button, provide speaker feedback. That's helpful for the speakers themselves and for us and the track team. 
when they do their session selection. Tonight, don't miss Trivia Night. It's from 9 p.m. to 11.45 p.m. Um, it is a 21 plus event, so remember to bring your ID. Um, and it's sponsored by Palantir, so we thank them for that. And it'll be in the Armory. There's some more details on the website as well, of course. Tomorrow, as I alluded to earlier, is our contribution day. So there are three types of contributions that happen on the last day of DrupalCon. General contributions for those who know what they want to do, how they want to contribute, self-organized uh, in the topics they want. Mentored contributions where the volunteer mentors will come together and help you learn how to contribute or help you perhaps contribute in a new way. In this case, perhaps it's learning how to uh, do better accessibility work. Um, and also the first time contributor workshop, which has been going on actually pretty much all week, but will continue again tomorrow uh, for anyone who's trying to contribute for the first time. Finally, where are we going next? Well, um, it's not a big surprise. We've actually already announced this, of course, but DrupalCon Amsterdam is coming up in October. So we'd love to see you there. We'd love to have you join us. And I'm actually thrilled to announce that registration has just opened now. And the call for papers has just opened now. So anyone interested in speaking or attending that event, um, it is ready to go. For the next North American event, we will be in Minneapolis, Minnesota of May, in May of 2020, which has got to be the future by now, right? Like, we're out of the teens in 2020. Absolutely the future. And then if you'd like to go to local events that might be closer to you, um, there's a wonderful community resource, DrupaCal, that tracks all of the local camps, all of the local meetups, um, everything like that that you um, might need. So with that, thank you all, and have a good evening.